the winningest coach in Oregon football history. Mike Bellotti, I hope you're doing well, sir. Welcome into the game in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Looking forward to talking with you and certainly uh, uh, getting your thoughts on, on a lot of different things. But let me start with what Nick Saban has been able to accomplish here in Tuscaloosa. From a coaching perspective, what is it about Nick Saban's process that you appreciate the most? I think the consistency. I, I've said before that uh, Nick Saban and his staff do probably the best job of evaluation recruitment and then development of the athletes and i think it's one thing to evaluate and say hey, these are the best players in the nation it's the second thing then to go out and recruit them and get them to commit to alabama and then the final thing is there's a lot of great commitments a lot of great five-star athletes that don't always pan out but they find a way to make sure that those guys live up to whatever star rating they had and uh they develop from within that program they do reload People don't like to say that, but they really do just reload. I think that defense is a perfect example, or even the quarterback position. So I think what Nick Saban has done in terms of the consistency, uh, the ability to have his players stay focused from game to game, no matter who they play, because typically they're the one with the bullseye on their back. Uh, They're the hunted, not the hunter. Uh, and and that's it's a more difficult situation typically. It's really hard to be the favorite all the time. When you look at Nick Saban, uh, but he'll have these guys, I know they're the favorite, they're the huge favorite in this game. Uh, today's the first day of practice, of bowl practice. By the December the 31st, he will have these players believing that they're the underdog. I mean, he, he will convince them psychologically that they're the underdog, that, that they, they have no chance in this game unless they play to perfection. Is that pretty talented well, as coach? I mean, that's true. And w- one way or the other, he's going to put an edge, give his team the edge, and that edge may be that they're being disrespected or they're over, you know, analyzing this or that, or we're not going to do anything. Look at this game, and he may take the last game and look at five or ten plays in which they didn't perform the way they need to, and point to those things. But you're right. I think his ability to flip that switch to make sure that his players uh, respect. Uh, not fear, expect all fear none in terms of the opponent and then find a way to make sure that you come out on top. As we move forward, let me ask you, when you look at a defense that is good as this one here, from an offensive mind like yourself, how would you attack this defense? Wow. If I could sneak a 12th man on the field, I'd do that. You know, I, I think uh, the reality <laughs> is you you have to keep that defense off balance. And and obviously the way to do that is to have some type of efficient, effective running game. And it may not be your standard runs. It may not be uh, a two-back lead play. It may not be a one-back zone read. It's got You've got to have some creativity in that. And certainly Chris Peterson and his Washington staff, that's one of the things they're looking at is how can we attack that Alabama defense? How can we keep them off balance? Their front is so good, so physical against the run. You've got to somehow negate that, which probably means you know, throwing more on first downs, doing something against the normal down and distance uh, ratio you would have. Uh, find a new look play that they have not seen before. Washington pulled out a play against Stanford that looked like the zone read, but it ended up being um, more of a speed sweep or speed option to the outside. You know, something of that nature. They've got to find some things that Alabama has not seen on film that they cannot prepare for. And I'm not sure that's possible. But uh, you have three weeks. uh, You have an idea of what you need to do. And then, you know, find ways, too. I I think from a – it's not just attacking the defense. I think certainly Jalen Hurts is a a success story, but he's also a guy that throwing the ball down the field – He's not as accurate as he needs to be in those situations. If you can force them into those situations, he very well may turn the ball over a couple of times. You've got to find ways to be efficient in taking the ball away and then capitalizing on turnovers. And the other the other area is special teams, because I don't think you just say, how can we beat the Alabama defense? That's the best thing that they do. So you've got to find ways on uh, offense or defense and special teams maybe you've got some trick plays dreamed up you're going to take some chances on special teams because you're probably not going to beat Alabama just saying hey we're going to run these plays what we've always done we're going to line up 
and we're going to kick their tail up front. That's not going to happen. Coach, when I look at Nick Saban changing, watching this offense evolve and adapt to current college football, from a coaching perspective, and I'm this way. I mean, even though I'm a sports radio guy, I'm stubborn. I'm stuck in my ways. You know, I like the, the same type of pants. I like the same shirt. I don't like change. Nick Saban has changed with the current direction of college football, and I never thought I'd watch this offense in Tuscaloosa. But a, how hard is it from a coaching perspective to adjust your philosophy to the current direction of college football like Nick Saban has done on the offensive side of the ball? I don't think it's that difficult. In fact, I think it's absolutely necessary and paramount if you want to be successful. You've got to find a way to put your players in a position to have success. And you also have to recognize what's happening in the world around you with defenses and what they're trying to do. And, you know, I made that same transition from a pro style to the spread zone read several years ago and the up-tempo stuff. And, and it does put a defense on its heels. It eliminates some of the advantages they may have. You don't always need the biggest, strongest, or fastest. You can get away with some little quick guys that can make uh, the life miserable for the, for the defense. But the reality is I think every coach uh, is, is, does two things as a head coach. One, you put your, your coaches in a position to have success. What do they know well? What do they do best? And sometimes you've got to guide them. You've got to point them in a direction say, guys, we need to go in this area on defense, uh, you know, more combo coverages or on offense. We've got to look at tempo, what it does for us. Or we've got to look at the spread stick because it makes life easier for the quarterback in terms of reads. You know, but you can, and you can mix and match downhill run game with some form of the spread. The pistol does that, some other things. But all I'm saying is I think Coach Saban has done a great job, and I think him allowing – uh, Lane Kiffin to modernize the offense, and I'm sure there were some, you know, there were some struggles there, and there were some uh, sleepless nights in terms of how we're going to do this, and are, am I going to be comfortable letting this happen? But their offense is scoring more points, and certainly they may not be as consistent as they have been in the past, but they are very, very explosive. And in this day and age, a lot of offenses are measured effectiveness by the number of explosive plays you create. Let me ask you about Washington. As you analyze them from your coaching mentality, what do you see in the Washington Huskies? Uh, I see a team that uh, is missing a couple of its best players on defense, uh, Mathis and Victor. Their leading sack guy and leading tackler are probably not going to play in this game. I see an offense led by Jake Browning, who's a a very good quarterback. He doesn't possess a real strong arm. He has a good sense of the pocket, but he needs a clean pocket uh, to be efficient. And I'm not sure he's going to get that against Alabama. Uh, Washington struggled late in the season against USC, and USC was probably the most improved team from Game 1 to Game 12 in the Pac-12 conference. Obviously, Alabama handled them very easily early. I think it was a different team. But the problem for me was that the or, the Washington offensive line did not handle the pressure of a four-man pass rush or the occasional fifth man in a zone blitz type situation from USC. I think they're going to see the same issues with Alabama. They have some great skilled players. Miles Gaskin, tough guy. John Ross, one of the most explosive receivers. And they've got a pretty good core of receivers, but they have to be very efficient, very effective in keeping Alabama off balance. As I said, throw on first down, get the ball out of Browning's hands quickly because it's very, very difficult. They're a good defensive football team. A lot of people would say a Chris Peterson coach team, well, it's all about uh, uh, gadgets and gimmicks and those type of things. That's really not true. At Boise State and at Washington, they have run the ball very well and they've defended the run very well. They don't turn the ball over. In fact, they're number one in the nation in turnover-takeaway ratio. They do a nice job. (laughs) Uh, offensively, I think they're fourth in the nation in scoring offensively. But on defense, it's going to be a different animal when they play Alabama. Let me ask you about the line of scrimmage. Do you see a line of scrimmage there in Washington that can hold up against either the offensive line or the defensive line here in Tuscaloosa? I think that's going to be the biggest mismatch, and I think that's why that point spread is so large. I just think that when you got guys like Tim Williams and Jonathan Allen and Ryan Anderson and Reuben Foster and Cam Robinson leading that offensive line. I mean, there, there's just that's a group of athletes across the board in the offensive and defensive line 
that are going to gain an advantage. And what I saw when I saw what Alabama did to Florida in the championship game, and Florida's a good defensive football team, an athletic team, but they just got knocked off the ball at the end of the game. And I think part of that was just their will to compete. I think Washington will compete. I think obviously they're excited to be there. They're you know it's their first year in that championship role in a playoff role. So they're they're not going to. Uh, back off, but I just think physically that is a mismatch at the line of scrimmage both ways that favors Alabama significantly. I'd love to ask you, if you don't mind, about a couple of coaches that I know that you're familiar with. Uh, the offensive coordinator job, as you know, Lane Kiffin departed uh, for FAU even though he's going to stay through the college football playoffs. We're hearing a very couple of strong names that have a lot of ties back to this Pac-12. Uh, Mark Helfridge is a name that's been tossed around here for a few days. It's been a buzzword in Tuscaloosa. I'm not saying he's going to get the job, but his name has been mentioned quite a bit here in Tuscaloosa. Help us understand Mark Helfridge from an offensive mentality. Well, Mark was a coordinator at Colorado. He was the coordinator, although Chip Kelly called the plays. He has helped with the offense the past four years. Obviously, he's the head coach at Oregon. He's extremely intelligent, very soft-spoken, understated, so to speak, but has a, a very good knowledge, I think, of, of a lot of styles of offense. But in terms of the spread and, and really the run game out of the spread, I think a lot of people have a, a misinterpretation that you go to the spread just to throw the ball and do all that. Really, uh, when I decided to take Oregon to the spread back in 2004, Oregon has led the league in rushing now for 12 or 13 consecutive years. And Mark Helfrich has been part of that for eight years as the coordinator and then as the head coach. So he's a guy that has a photographic memory, very intelligent, can talk about all forms of offense and defense. But I think that he would be a guy that uh, would be very interesting. He's not quite the same uh, personality as Lane Kiffin, but I think the results would be similar. Okay. His name has certainly been tossed around, and uh, I know that it's disappointing there that they had to make a decision – uh, back at the end of November, but uh, I mean, if you were giving him advice, w- would you get back in coaching, or would you sit out for a couple of years? <laughs> well, I think he's got an over eleven million dollar settlement, so I'm not sure he he can take a little bit of time to find the right job that he wants. I don't know that any coach, uh, whether you get fired or not, really wants to go get out of football. I think your coaching is in your blood; you've done it. Yeah, that's how you what you wake up every day thinking about. Uh, and certainly the chance to be a coach, you know, a, a head coach at Oregon, an offensive coordinator at Oregon, an offensive coordinator at Alabama, those are things that very few people have an opportunity to do in their lifetime. So I think it'd be a huge challenge. It'd be a great learning experience. Mark is young enough that he would be able to learn from Nick Saban uh, and, uh, you know, c- contrast that with myself or Chip Kelly. And they're all a little bit different personalities. But, uh, He'd, he'd do a tremendous job, and if that's what he wants to do. But I'm not sure, you know, when you when you go through something like this, he said something about, I don't know what a train wreck, train wreck feels like, but I think this might be close, you know. And so you, it takes a while to recover, but uh, the best way, as everybody knows, to, you know, when you fall off a horse, you just got to get back on. Oh, and, and we've watched so many people come through this Nick Saban system uh, that have, you know, the fallen in the valleys. I'm not saying $11 million, va- you know, valley there. But, I mean, uh, Nick Saban is, is one of those guys that's un- unpredictable. So I don't know exactly which direction he will go. There's another name that's been brought up quite often, Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, I'm just curious what you think about Sark as an offensive mind. Uh, I like Sark as an offensive mind. I think he does a good job. I think uh, both he and Lane Kiffin are very similar somewhat in their philosophies. I've worked. Uh, through television with both of them. I also coached against them when they were assistant coaches at USC. I have great respect for them, and I think if Steve uh, is ready to go, then he would be an excellent choice also. I I think you can't go wrong. And, you know, Nick Saban has, has, what, five to eight ex-head football coaches on that staff now and some consultant basis or whatever. So he's got his choice, and he's going to be able to interview and talk football with some great minds that it really depends on where he wants to go and which expertise. You know, Sarkeesian has a little bit more of the combination power football 
uh, you know, that, that running attack that they used to run at SC and still favor initially at Alabama. But uh, And Helfrich would be more of a spread guy. So I think it's more in uh, Nick Saban's mind about where I want to go with this team and what's going to fit the personnel I have and, and who I really trust turning that offense over to. Mike Bellotti. Coach Bellotti, I really appreciate the conversation. I appreciate us, uh, you giving us an opportunity to tap your brain for a couple of minutes and tap into that database of knowledge about college football. Merry Christmas from all of us here in Tuscaloosa. We greatly appreciate you for being a part of the show. Thank you. You guys too.